Hello again, and welcome back to another riveting episode of Optimal Anesthesia. Today, we'll be discussing the interesting topic of neuromuscular blockade reversal. It's a long and winding road from prehistoric arrow poisons to cutting-edge wonder medications. Get comfortable and join us as we take a look at the fascinating background of this vital part of anesthesia's history and modern science. Let's go back in history for a moment. Let's pretend it's the 16th century and you've joined Sir Walter Raleigh on one of his expeditions to the Amazon. His cryptic reference to Tupra, Karari, or Arari indicates that he is talking about a local arrow poison. Unbeknownst to him, the active ingredient in this poison was a compound called Karari, which would go on to play a crucial role in the evolution of current methods of neuromuscular blockade reversal. To counteract the paralyzing effects of Karari on skeletal muscles, researchers in the 19th century developed physostigmine, which is produced from the calabar bean. Moving ahead to the early 20th century, Kararin, a derivative from Karari, was used clinically to help patients relax before and during surgery. This event served as a watershed moment in the development of anesthesia. By the 1930s, the active component tabacurarine had been isolated from Karari and its chemical structure had been elucidated. In 1942, doctors like Harold Griffith and Enid Johnson were already taking bold measures to treat patients with Karari, also called intercostrin. But this resulted in brand new difficulties, such as the need of a physiological antidote. This is where physostigmine, subsequently renamed neostigmine, comes in. It was proposed in 1943 as an antidote for Karari, although its dose was mostly untested at the time. It wasn't until 1948 that experts started suggesting diluting intravenous neostigmine with atropine to reduce its negative effects. However, there were obstacles. In the middle of the 1950s, problems like neostigmine-resistant cararization arose, in which patients did not improve as predicted despite treatment with the drug. It was shocking to see that neuromuscular blockers had such a high fatality rate. Subpar perioperative care and the difficulty of residual blockage continue to be issues that medical professionals must solve. Now, let's shift gears and talk about what it takes to ensure adequate recovery from neuromuscular blockade. Imagine you're an anesthesiologist preparing to awaken a patient after a complex surgery. What criteria must be met? First, we have the train of four ratio. Think of it as a gauge for muscle recovery. We want it to be at least 0.9 before we can safely remove the breathing tube. It measures how muscles respond to nerve stimulation, and a TOF ratio below 0.9 can lead to difficulties in speaking, swallowing. Next, we have the restoration of esophageal tone. This is crucial for normal swallowing and preventing aspiration. Picture it as the muscles in the esophagus coming back to life. Then, there's pharyngeal coordination. Recovery should ensure proper coordination for speech and swallowing. Imagine those muscles synchronizing perfectly. And don't forget the hypoxic ventilatory drive. This is like your body's built-in alarm system for low oxygen levels. It needs to return to normal to ensure proper breathing. Lastly, muscle strength must return to baseline levels for normal motor function to resume. It's like your muscles saying, I'm back, and I'm ready. But here's the catch, residual neuromuscular blockade or residual paralysis, is a common postoperative problem. Picture this, nearly half of the patients in the post-anesthesia care unit, PACU, experience it, especially after long-acting neuromuscular blocking drugs are used. This poses significant risks, like critical respiratory events. What makes it even more challenging is that anesthesia providers often have differing opinions on how to assess adequate recovery, leading to inconsistencies in practice. 
and this can result in prolonged recovery times, more complications, and delayed discharge from the PACU or hospital. A real headache for both patients and healthcare professionals. So, how do we reverse neuromuscular blockade? Well, there are two primary methods, inhibition of acetylcholinesterase, imagine it as hitting the pause button on acetylcholinesterase, the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. By doing this, we increase acetylcholine levels at the neuromuscular junction, promoting muscle contraction. It's like giving a booster shot to muscle function. Sugamadex, selective relaxant binding agent, this is the modern superhero of neuromuscular blockade reversal. It forms complexes with muscle relaxants like rocuronium and vecuronium, swiftly removing them from the bloodstream. Think of it as a superhero swooping in to rescue our muscles from the clutches of relaxation. And speaking of Sugamadex, let's dive into its history. This breakthrough reversal agent was introduced in the 2000s and represented a game-changer in the world of anesthesia. For years, we struggled with the limitations of traditional agents like neostigmine, but Sugamadex offered a more efficient and precise way to reverse the effects of muscle relaxants. Its development marked a significant leap forward, improving patient safety and recovery. But, just like any superhero, these agents have their kryptonite drug interactions. Neostigmine, for instance, can interact with drugs affecting cholinergic transmission, leading to unexpected outcomes. On the other hand, Sugamadex's interactions are mainly related to its binding with neuromuscular blocking agents like rocuronium and vecuronium. It doesn't dabble with cholinergic receptors. And there you have it, a whirlwind tour of the world of neuromuscular blockade reversal. From ancient arrow poisons to cutting-edge drugs like Sugamadex, we've seen how far we've come in ensuring patient safety and recovery in the realm of anesthesia. Thank you for joining us today on Optimal Anesthesia. Stay tuned for more captivating stories and discoveries from the world of anesthesia.